as far as women are concerned in, in entering the workforce, are there less obstacles, would you say, for them to, to make a living and get a job that they want? Waking up in the morning and driving out, I can tell you that on its own has created a new cultural shift. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to the Mo Show podcast, episode 24. My guest tonight is Dr. Lama Suleiman. In 2005, she was the first woman to be elected as deputy chairperson of the Saudi Chamber of Commerce, becoming the first female to hold such a position in Saudi history. She was later re-elected. Dr. Lama was also one of the first 20 selected women for the Saudi Municipality Council. She was a board member of the Khadija bin Khwailid Lobbying Center for Women and a member of the Ministry of Labor's Advisory Board on Women Issues. She's on the MENA Advisory Board for Coots Bank that is based in the UK. In 2011, Arabian Business selected her fifth out of 100 most powerful women in the Arab world. I'd like to welcome Dr. Lama as Suleiman. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I think it was the longest introduction from all my guests, and I, I think it uh, is a testament to, mashallah, your accomplishments and everything you've done for the country and, and our community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, a bit of background, uh, Dr. Lama. You have a PhD from King's College in London. Um, what was that PhD in um, is my first question. And the second one is, were you always keen on getting involved in, uh, in governmental or you know, in, in, in um, work that involves bettering the society um, and community? So, um, <coughs> yes, I started, uh, I actually graduated from King Abdul Aziz University here in Saudi. I graduated in biochemistry and then I uh, decided to look for a job which was exactly what I ended up 20, if not more years later, helping others. Mm -hmm. So seeking a job at that time was not easy. I had the choice of uh, working in a high school, which I did not really want. And uh, I could also maybe work as an assistant at the university, which also was not something I wanted because I was not too keen to work in an all women environment. It did not really suit me at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I found a job at the uh, King Fahad Research Center and they were looking for lab technicians and I decided to go for that. It was more a job per project. So okay. it's not really a long term or full time job, but I decided to take it. There I found uh, many women doctors, uh, including I think um, your aunt, Dr. Samir Aslam. Mm who and uh, my mentor, Dr. Suhad Bahijri, who pushed me to continue my, uh, to further my education. And uh, as I was working as a lab technician, I applied to King's College, and I was very lucky that they accepted overseas students. So I would work in Saudi, and then I would go and pass my exams in, uh, in the UK. I, I know that in the UK, they don't have these overseas students okay. anymore. They require people to be there full time. Mm -hmm. So um, once I graduated, there was, um, I was sick. So I, was, um, I had breast cancer, and uh, that uh, stopped me for a while, for a year and a half, where everything was at a standstill very similar to the corona time we're going through today. So you're confined at home, you're slow, um, uh, socializing is not as, as happening. So very similar to today, actually. Um, but that's, that was good for me. It, um, it slowed me down and um, I took my time to think of what I wanted to do next. And I decided that I did not want to work in the hospital or in the uh, social welfare yep. and uh, and the opportunity to uh, join the chamber of commerce uh, arised and i i was invited by a slate and i joined the elections and um, i won i was one of two that won and two others were appointed and i think the whole the saudi was at uh, you know, a lot of, it, it was a response to so many women before me that were, um, you know, asking for change, asking for more. Yeah. And uh, thank God we, I hope, yeah, I, I think that was the beginning of the more. Um, I'm sorry to hear about what you had to go through. Alhamdulillah that you, this is the first I hear of it actually. Um, Alhamdulillah that you, uh, that you beat it. 
and um, and uh, and you're looking strong as uh, as ever. For, uh, that's that's really great news. And um, Dr. Lama, yani for you to be nominated as the first um, to enter uh, the Saudi Chamber of Commerce, first female, that's that's a real big achievement. Um, I can just, I mean, I would imagine like all the females that came before you that have applied and, and, and tried to, to, to get that position and, and didn't. And, uh, and there you are who finally did, you know, in making history. Do you look back uh, at that fondly thinking that uh, that was, you know, one of your uh, best achievements looking back? So um, when we first won the election, we were two of us. Okay. So I was not alone. I was not. So both of us were the first. Mm -hmm. um, I have to um, give a lot of the credit to the slate that supported us. So it was a slate of a very progressive uh, men who uh, were very eager to see things change. And I must also uh, admit to that uh, the government had uh, started that policy mm -hmm. and there was a royal decree to allow the women to join the uh, elections. So that means there was a top-down also kind of support. So I was supported in uh, policy by policies themselves and second by the men, which is what is happening but I want to also say that the policies and the men's support only happens after the women ask mm -hmm. so women need to ask for those in power to listen and to then help by creating the policies that are going to support more women participation yeah we spoke on the phone about a week ago, me and you, and you brought something to my attention that I had absolutely no response for, and, and I actually really appreciated the point. I was telling you how, look at how females are entering the workforce at rates that we've never seen before, and you were saying, yes, that's you know all good, but who's still in charge of the hiring process? Look at your company, look at the next company. How many people in, in, in the hiring committee are males, and, and how many females are there? And, and I told you that, um, or at least in my company that I work on, they're all males, and uh, and that was a point, that was like a trigger that I that I thought that okay, we know we are hiring women at, at at an amazing rate, but are they the decision makers of which women get hired? So it was just a point that actually resonated with me that I feel that it's something that uh, maybe corporations should look at. You know, it's 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 good from far, but as they say, the devil's in the details. When you look into it, like what positions are these females holding? Is it just sec secretary jobs, or is it something that requires a little bit more? So, so you brought that point to my attention and I thought it was a very good one. So this all goes back to um, something that all books have written about. It's called the unconscious bias. So people, uh, people tend to be biased unconsciously. Mm. And uh, men that are eager to help uh, employ more women in their, um, in their institution sometimes fall for this unconscious bias. Um, I remember in the early days here in Saudi when we had some workshops and talk about men and talk about the women, yep. uh, a lot of the men would discuss what jobs they believed were suitable for women. And there was a big debate because uh, a lot of the women would come forward and say, why should you choose what is suitable for me? Yeah. Why can't I choose what is suitable for me? This is why I say policies to create a leveled playing field that has a equal opportunity for both men and women is the most important, whether it is inside the corporation or whether it is on a whole government uh, plan. So we cannot choose when to start hiring women in leadership position, and we should not choose what jobs are more suitable for men or women. Um, we cannot look at challenges and create a stereotype for women. So you find the suitability point is usually discussed because you know, a lot of the men might say, you know, they need a place in case they're mothers. What if they get pregnant? What then? Uh, are we set to give them, can the company uh, stay um, afloat if we have two women mm -hmm. on a one-year vacation? Can we survive that? 
Well, you know, today with flexible hours, today Corona has shown that all companies can survive. And I think two to 10 women not being there because they had to have uh, a child or they are better off staying at home uh, to raise a family, that I do not think that affects a lot of these companies. So flexibility and thinking about it differently with no more bias, unconscious bias and no more stereotyping I think would be better for the future. Uh, as far as women are concerned in, in entering the workforce are there less obstacles would you say for them to to make a living and get a job that they want? Of course I mean um, just waking up in the morning and driving out I can tell you that on its own has created a new cultural shift uh the amount of women from different cultural background i see on the road driving that on its own shows that the family is supportive of those women going out and seeking work uh, the um, the uh, amount of women though that are participating in the workforce is still quite low even though we see them everywhere and People feel like, you know, we are hearing so much about women. We read in the newspaper about women having. So we need to be very careful not to relax by saying, I see them everywhere. They're all over the place. Therefore, it's enough. And I think there are enough policies around to support them. No, I think knowing that a lot of the um, uh, other cultures around the world that have started supporting um, increasing women participation still face challenges. We need to be aware that that does not make us different. So uh, the conversation about more women and why and how is very important because what works for one company does not mean it can work for another. So everybody should constantly have that conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think women need a more flexible environment Mm. Um, I mean um, it's it's a fact you know and I think as you know when we um, a lot of young people from of of your generation and even younger also are saying they need more flexible environment to work in so that rigidity of punching in and punching out I am very much not pro that Mm. Uh, That does not mean that I have been able on many boards to change that culture. A lot of people still think this is necessary to teach discipline. Um, We as a private sector are still not um, creative enough, uh, especially in our part of the world, to um, uh, create the Google environment. Not meaning that I am also 100% for the Google way of doing work, but I think there must be a happy medium. You know, there must be a happy. Flexible hours and um, giving people the right to have uh, um, some hours off on a bad day, I think would improve performance. Um, a professor at NCA told me that, you know, um, it's no more today, the conversation and the narrative is no more about uh, your business performance, it's about progress. Mm -hmm. And progress means involving the people working in the company. And progress means that everybody is comfortable and there is teamwork and there is motivation so that you can unleash their potential and unleash their will and their wanting to come to work. So all of this is still early here. And that would encourage more women in Saudi to uh, leave their homes because a woman in her nature will prefer to stay home, take care of the kids, especially when the kids are young. So as much as her heart is set to go after a career, leaving those beautiful kids behind is not something that she would choose and it's not. And the ecosystem and the infrastructure here today is still not um, enough for a lot of the women that resist today for looking for a job because they prefer to stay home. It'll take something special for them to leave their house. Yes. Yeah. Um, Dr. Lama, you were involved as a mediator in in the G20. 
uh, just maybe what three four months ago what was that experience like for you um, B20 talks is is something that is uh, continuous so every year it builds on the year before it it is extremely important what I have learned um, from uh, these task forces and these groups and the work that is put there is that it sets the tone it creates the trend which is extremely important because it also uh, uh, puts the standards that a lot of countries try to achieve so when we discuss at, about uh, uh, women in business it means that yes we every country around the world is thinking about increasing their entrepreneurs and uh, creating um, special uh, majors for entrepreneurs maybe doing uh, financing them uh, helping them be more creative because they will create jobs and um, and that will help even employ more women but women are always uh, left behind women mm. always find it more difficult to find financing um, even though if you look at all the studies it shows that women are always very serious at paying their loans and it's 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 numbers it's data it's uh, it's not just uh, uh, it's facts yeah. so women are much more serious but maybe uh, women are more um, uh, shy towards risk taking mm -hmm. so that's and true. and that's very important i think as an entrepreneur yeah. but if the ecosystem is right they will start businesses and let's not forget that women in countries like Saudi Arabia are also part of family businesses yeah. and um. that is also something that I personally am very interested in because we still live in the culture that most family business are led by the men even though one of the most famous women and the leader of business women worldwide is a Saudi woman who Absolutely. is Lubna Lubna. Lubna. Yeah. I mean we yeah. all look up and I th sometimes look up at her and say no I think she's much too uh, high for me and this has but globally she's I think she is today one of the leading women in the world absolutely she's always referenced yes I yeah. mean so so the culture of having women lead has been around us yeah. for many, many years. Uh, the center I worked in for 15 years was called the Khadija bint Khuwailid Center. That was a businesswoman. She was the Prophet Muhammad's wife. All these characteristics, this personality is not the characteristic and personality of the stereotyped women today worldwide. Yeah. So hopefully we'll revive that character again yeah would you say that um you know if someone has a, a business idea in saudi um is there a center you can go to or a um an entity that will study your business plan and and find a way to fund it for you you know via loan do we have that infrastructure available on the ground here today the infrastructure for the past 10 years has grown and there has been progress in it so there is today this body called Munchiat, which is part of the ministry of commerce it's an authority that focuses on smes um, it does do a lot but i've also um, met a lot of uh, part of other big companies who have considered it part of the csr to support smaller uh, companies and startups some um, Aramco has its own uh, the King Abdullah University has its own um, some banks uh, have their own so yes it is more common today everybody is interested um, in helping these startups um, today we have venture capitalists uh, local venture capitalists that are working here um, I remember 10 years ago, it was not something that was you could find on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the narrative of entrepreneurship, financing, um, creating a feasibility study, the plan, uh, all of this is a conversation that is ongoing. And I think the ecosystem is growing. Yeah, that's good. It's, I think it's important info for people who have an idea but don't have funds. Uh, that they can, uh, you know, with a, with a strong business case, 
they can find funding for a project because this way we encourage entrepreneurs to start businesses and that will lead to employment. But also the public investment uh, funds is have also local funds, okay. smaller ones. I think when we talk, when we listen to everything that is happening with the public investment fund, we only think of these mega projects that yeah. are happening. So yeah. people tend to shy away. But I've also, um, um, I want to encourage young people to go and find out like I do. It's not like I have inside information. Mm -hmm. I don't today, I do not, I'm no more in the Chamber of Commerce. But I feel that looking into their sites is very insightful. Mm -hmm. So I like to, um, every once in a while, go into these sites, the PIF site, uh, different ministry sites. And just reading what there is available, you will find that there are so many things that are happening simultaneously that we are slightly a bit confused of where we should go and where we, uh, who, would, who can help us. Yeah. So I do understand that confusion on the ground, but if we believe that there is, I think uh, we need to push ourselves to research a bit better and I think we will find the answer. Yeah. It is out there, but not always easy to access. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've seen uh, a lot of changes happening um, and uh, the spotlight being put on females in Saudi in entering the sports world. Um, recently, I've seen uh, Dania Agil uh, and what she's done in the motorsports, uh, Rima Jafali as well with what she's done in car racing, and also Delma. Um, and I'm proud to say that all three were on the show. And, and there are a lot other females like uh, this, this, this um, uh, Saudi football team. That they're, they're actually in the middle of launching Saudi football league, which is something that is pretty much unheard of. Do you, are you encouraged when seeing those things? Do you think that uh, it will resonate positively in other areas uh, with regards to female empowerment in the country? I mean, sport is uh, for me uh, very important. Um, in the year 2000, I uh, attempted to open a health club here in Saudi. My partner, Randall Fadl, and myself in the year 2000, because I was graduating in uh, nutrition, I decided, you know, I have the expertise to start a, uh, uh, a health club uh, for women. So at that time, it was not allowed. So it was completely against the law. And I went to the governor of uh, uh, Jeddah at that time was Prince Abdul Majid. And, and I said, you know, it's not fair. And um, they said that um, only hospitals were allowed to have health clubs as a rehab centers. Um, but that I believe that I could uh, open my own uh, health club for women. Mm. So he gave me a letter. He just gave me a letter that says, um, I allow Lama and Randall Fadel to open a health club. <laughs> and we opened it. The first of its kind for females. Well, it's not the first, of course. There were health clubs for females. But earlier, there was a health club for f uh, females here in Jeddah called the Galleria. Okay. And I think everybody of my generation used to go to it. And then I think then they had problems and challenges that they faced and they had to close down. Okay. And Again, it was the culture, it was the stereotype, it was an era where for women to move forward was a big challenge. Um, so uh, I closed it down this year, 2020, so 20 years later. Uh, I'm proud to say that it has been successful all along. Uh, I was only able to license it two years ago because of the sports authority and that's only then that they gave real licenses to health clubs for women and um, so i'm happy to say that i was able to survive 18 years with no license <laughs> you can say that now that you're no longer <laughs> yes, operating absolutely <laughs> i uh, renda and i were closed down maybe more than 10 times okay and then you show them the letter no, not always, you know, not always, but we always found a way to lobby for ourselves, to go and fight and say, why? Give us one good reason. We were in an all women mall. No men could even see us. There was no windows, no doors that could uh, allow any men to be in. It was, uh, it had all the regulations that were required. It was clean, mm -hmm. it was healthy. We had um, 
and and we survived we survived it it just means again and and what made us push more to keep running that health club was because it we had a vision that women should be allowed to exercise and women were coming to the club and they were having a great time and and next to us was a hospital and I would see in the morning doctors, nurses, all these ladies come in and it was a perfect place for them to improve. And this was the reason for us being adamant not to close down. And this was always the reason we lobbied for yeah. and not just a reason that this is our business. This is does not necessarily need to be our business. That business had a positive impact on society, therefore has a good reason to stay alive. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, what would you say is our country's biggest achievement in the last five years? There's been a lot of movement, a lot of changes. What's your, what, what in your view is our biggest achievement in the last five? I think from um, the points I would as a citizen here see is the social uh, empowerment of women has been really, I mean, for me has been the most uh, impactful one. Starting from driving again, I would say, uh, and then creating the ecosystem that pushes women to look for opportunities. Um, Saudi Arabia has always been a country that changes from top down, which is, it doesn't necessarily change, start from top down out of nothing, but it's when the top listens to the masses calling for something that is necessary and a necessity uh, for its society, once it listens, it will act. And the action from top down usually will leap and accelerate the ability to execute. Mm -hmm. So today, women walk down the street feeling empowered yep. because it's top down. We walk and we sit and no one dares. And I'm not talking about the three major cities. I am talking about having visited, especially now during Corona, you know, we've all been able to get to know our country. Um, so from Abha to Jazan, to Al-Baha, to Taif, to Al-Ula, to Hail, to every city I have visited, women are moving with strength. Yeah. Women are not shy. I do not see them shy away. They're not thinking twice about doing something. They're going out. And the, and the, the, the best part is that their families, brothers, fathers, husbands, are supportive, yeah. very supportive. And I think this needs to be looked at. I think this is a, something that needs to be studied because I think other cultures that have had or still have challenges in empowering women could learn a lot. I myself have not yet understood exactly. I know it has to do with the behavior, but we need to go even deeper in it and research it because there's a lot of learning in there. Yeah, a lot, mm -hmm. a lot. Um, and how quickly people adapted to it. It's unbelievable. It was overnight. You would think women have been driving here for a decade plus. Absolutely. If you didn't know any better, if you were American to arrive today, you'd, you'd think that, wait, there's no way they just announced it two years ago. Seamless. But then, you know, I want to also discuss this part is that because there has been so many positive things happening for women in Saudi, I'm always concerned that we might forget of some of the negative things that do happen f to women everywhere around the world. Harassment will always be something that we need to discuss. Abuse in the family is something that cannot be forgotten. Uh, these are matters that we should not shy away from just because things look good. 
if we see around us a lot of lucky women, there are many more that are unlucky. And we need to all make sure that we also participate in listening, uh, looking for signs that show women or uh, young girls who might need in the society our support, our help, because they're going through difficult time. It is still very difficult for a woman today uh, that is either divorced or widowed or abused, of course, to uh, be able to look for a job mm -hmm. because sometimes it is not as easy to leave her kids behind. And these cases must be highlighted because I know that sometimes we have had done such wonderful things that these important discussions might just be missed. Yeah. Um, is there something you want to see change in the next two or three years? Is there anything more than what I've seen? There's always, I'm greedy. It's never enough. You know, we're, um, uh, we're looking at Vision 2030 and we can already visualize where we're going. Uh, COVID-19 has not made things look as clear anymore. The world around us um, does not look as stable anymore. However, um, I just would like to see us continue moving to where we were supposed to go. And the only way to do that is to support all you know, civil societies that are available in Saudi. We cannot forget them. I know it's important that the private sector needs to uh, be vibrant and um, uh, but um, civil societies in Saudi need to also be empowered to be able to have more impact mm -hmm. when uh, you and I were not uh, questioning we were discussing at the, the 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 issue of impact and um, I always worry that we turn become more individualistic and it's and and we are producing in a a, a future generation of my career. Mm -hmm. I made it. Uh, I am the next. Uh, it's always the next. The same ten people that people uh, tend to be inspired by. It's either Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Yeah. All these uh, ten or twenty people. Yeah. Uh, we tend to all everywhere around the globe be motivated by. But I want to say that there are much more people around us that have impact and that think in a collective manner. And we come from a culture that has always thought in a collective manner. And I'm just hoping that moving forward, we do not forget that whether we are in the enter into your first steps into your job or whether you are leading in your job, mm -hmm. you always should remember to have an impact. Yep. One person, 10 people, a thousand, however many you can impact. I think that's what I would like to see is more impact. Yep. And don't underestimate how much of an impact you can create. No, absolutely you know, not. No matter what position you have. Um, anyone can be the next dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, is, are, you, are you happy? It takes me to my next point. Are you happy with how even the playing field is right now? not only male, female, but also age. Um, do the young have similar opportunities as the old do in, in 21, would you say? Is the field level-ish? 75% are under the age of 35, I think. So, um, so the rest are either uh, older or well, the rest are older, so 25% uh, are either retired mm -hmm. or elderly, and only a few are in the workforce. Um, that is today amazing because that is rendering society vibrant. Uh, but that also needs to be taken into consideration. Um, these, the young today should be aware that they are building for their tomorrow, for their future. And they should look at the 
and to say, when I become a them, am I happy with what I am building now? Mm. And if you don't think of yourself being them, you're going to miss out. And um, you know, you, we don't want to end up, so, so that huge number in, in a few years is going to be part of the 25%. Yeah. So the 25% is gonna grow much faster than we expect. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we have the ecosystem ready and the environment ready for them to be able to settle. Yeah. So I know they should be motivated today in building, but also they need to be aware that they're building their own tomorrow. Yeah. Is, is that what is that? Does that encapsulate your advice for, for people entering the business world? Um, you know, think of your tomorrow, you know, your, your legacy. Think of, you know, where you want to be in 20, 30 years. What, what, what would be your advice for people entering the workforce today? You know, the 22, 23 year olds. It's about impacting. Creating an impact. It's, it's, yes, it's important to reach the top. Yes, it's important to have a leadership position. Um, um, I am, uh, you know, we talk all the time about increasing uh, women in the, including women in leadership position, more women in leadership position. Um, but women at the start don't think of the leadership position because they shy away from leadership mm -hmm. position because leadership position uh, that are held by men are intimidating to women. Women feel that the men on the board make very important manly decision. In reality, the top, which is the board level of any company, and uh, is no more difficult than the starting. So all you are carrying with you to reach the top is your experience. experience yeah. That's the only thing. And whether you're a man or a woman, I think that experience you have is going to have an impact on the conversation, yeah. whether at board level or whether through a workshop or whatever. Um, and going back to women, women shy away from numbers. This is again what I said previously about women in family business. Women and families have just as much right to be part of the conversation or where the investment is, what properties to buy, what properties not to buy. Our brain is not built in a way that numbers don't uh, fit in there. Numbers will fit. Um, I've seen men who were uh, school dropouts and were able to, after a few experience years, be able to tackle numbers. So I think women that are, were not very friendly with numbers could find. So that's why financial education for women is, in my opinion, extremely oh, important. Yeah. Yeah. Women yeah. need to feel they are financially independent. Yeah. And that's the really one of the major ways of empowering women today. Correct. It's like a new language. You know, you got to yes. learn it so you can. Yes. Uh, because it's Chinese if you don't understand, um, um, if you can't speak finance. Yeah, but it's really not that much. It's, see, they make it sound like it's Chinese because yeah. they write it in a complex way. But if you were taught properly and if it's more simplified, yeah. I think. I think when also I see when uh, uh, people don't understand exactly what is happening, they prefer to complex things. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. Uh, everybody thinks that uh, it's too complex yeah. to try to understand. But if you can't simplify an in information, that means you really don't, don't understand, understand, it. understand yeah. it. The old <laughs> saying, if you can't convince them, confuse them. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think um, the landscape will change where we'll see more females in like CEO roles uh, in the next decade. If the only thing we lack here is experience, you look at the West, how many females you know are leading companies. Is that just a matter of time for us here then? Yes, of course. And the West do not have enough women CEOs and they are struggling. And today the West is pushing for quotas mm -hmm. of women on boards. France is already uh, uh, put a quota for women's on uh, uh, publicly uh, public companies. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it is a problem everywhere. Uh, the US is the same, but of course, with ev everywhere around the world, this is part of the media. Yeah. Um, companies that do um, highlight these positions, but it's not a 50 50 opportunity anywhere around the world today. Uh, Singapore also has a quota. Uh, many countries around the world don't like quotas. 
because they think quotas are also unfair to men. Mm. But I think when the numbers are, and as we said again, when the playing field is not leveled, you need to give that push through a quota. Absolutely. So uh, Saudi Arabia will need the quota. Uh, that is the only way to encourage to have more women on leadership position. And then quota to level the playing field. I think women will have enough experience yeah to be able to uh, participate in these leadership position and yeah. decision making. Exciting times ahead. Oh, absolutely. If it's just experience that they lack, then you know, by maybe 2030 will be field. Yeah, but today, again, if I go back to that, we have 75% are young people. Mm -hmm. Therefore, which means that 75% of my population has no experience, Sorry. whether men or women. So I don't see why the women will have less experience than the men. So you're going to have a 35-year-old who might have worked for the past 10 years, 12 years. Uh, usually that means you'll have more young men who've worked for 10 to 12 years, but you will find uh, less, of course, women, but you will find women yeah. in mm -hmm. the next 10 years who have had 10 years experience. Just like the men, they started at the same time. Yes. You know, there's no... Uh, yes. Uh, discrepancy between the two Not really. um is there anything you want to uh close with before we let you go any um uh you know advice the whole idea i came here was like uh, you know i want to motivate these young women and young men yeah. to move forward to uh, stay away we, we live in a corona time everybody's pessimistic people seem to want to share more uh, negative uh, information than positive one. We look at the media um, with the vaccine, all this miscommunication, misinterpretation, creating confusion, chaos um, is sad. Uh, I was happy to be, I looked forward to coming here and joining your show because, you know, there's so much, so much positiveness around the world, yeah. here yeah. in Saudi, um, um, around us, anywhere. So um, there are opportunities. I mean, the, 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 the business opportunities in, Saudis, in Saudi is, we're very lucky. Yeah. It's more than anywhere else around the world. Um, we just need to stay optimistic. Yeah. And we need to have reasonable uh, um, goals. You know, doesn't mean people should not dream. Dream. But when you dream, dream with others with you. Yeah. Don't go off on a tangent. Don't and, just uh, go on, on yourself. Yes. Yeah. No, no, think of others with you. Yeah. yeah and you grow and let others grow with, with you. you. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, thank you, honestly, for taking time to come on the show. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's a very valuable episode because I think, you know, people will look at you and what you accomplished. I mean, it took me a couple of minutes to get through your intro. Um, and I hope that inspires people. Um, you know, to, to do more, to go out there and uh, not to be complacent uh, mm -hmm. with what you do in life. We can always do a little bit more. And my God, are you someone who's done a little bit more? And, and that's, a bit, you know, that's a bit of euphemism. You've done a lot more for your community and, and your country. And we really appreciate everything that you've done, Dr. Lama. And uh, thank you for coming on the show. And mm -hmm. uh, we hope you enjoyed yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And this is my first podcast. Amazing. Yes. And number uh, one. <laughs> inshallah, I'll be able to do some more. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'd love to have you back on. Thank Thanks you again, Dr. Lama. Thank much you. appreciated. Bye-bye.